Good day, I'm Dr. Scott Wright from Mayo Clinic, a professor, and today I have the privilege of convening a roundtable review on the perceptions and attitudes toward health-related research participation among African-American women. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Sharon Hayes, founding director of the Women's Heart Clinic at Mayo Clinic and now director of diversity and a longtime researcher in this field, and Dr. LaPrincess Brewer, one of our advanced clinical fellows who has also graduate work in this topic. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. Thank for you having both us. for coming. Thank you. Thanks. It's a great topic. We're here to discuss what I have described as an absolutely brilliant survey and paper led by our two discussants, Dr. Brewer and Dr. Hayes, about the perceptions among African American women and their participation in clinical research. Let me start by saying to both of you, well done. What a fantastic paper and research project. I know it took several years, Sharon, but it is outstanding. Congratulations. Thank you. The paper is entitled The Perception of uh, African American uh, Women and Their Attitudes Regarding Research Participation in Medical Research, the Mayo Clinic and the Lynx Incorporated Partnership, published in the Journal of Women's Health, Volume 23, November 8, this year, 2014. It was designed by a team led by Dr. Hayes, and Sharon, let me commend you on this, and just describe for us for a moment, if you will, the background for this and how you got uh, connected with the Lynx and what a great opportunity it's been. Well, as many things that happen at Mayo Clinic, often it is patient-driven. So it actually was one, a very grateful patient um, who was a Lynx member who really wanted Mayo to um, work with the Lynx Incorporated uh, to advance both of our missions, particularly among health disparities. And we work with Dr. Monica Parker, who's a family practitioner and was their national chair of Health and Human Services. Um, she's at Emory University. So we had um, discussed mutual priorities and decided that this was an important one. And as Dr. Uh, Parker had indicated, she said, you know, there is no research about people like me, um, educated uh, individuals who maybe were just not asked. And we think that we need to be part of the solution for African-American health. So it was through her mentorship and leadership and the collaboration that we came up with a way to use the resources at Mayo Clinic to develop the survey and um, have the, the links as the perfect uh, survey participants. Now the, the survey participants are by any measure a, a group of leaders who are empowered. I mean 95% are either actively working or retired as professionals. 95% I think had college degrees over half of them earn more than $150,000 a year, maybe a third to half. Uh, very successful women leaders. Uh, what was it like to sit in the room with uh, these powerful people? I mean, you, you can describe them, but I imagine they were leaders in every community in this country. So the Lynx Incorporated is a national organization, and it is the leaders in these women's communities. So they are doctors, lawyers, judges, um, business owners, and they are, it was very clear in having conversations that they wanted to make a difference in their communities. The Lynx Incorporated isn't just something where somebody donates money and then they're done with it. They actually have a required number of volunteer hours every year or they're out if they don't do oh, wow. it. So they are, this is a group of women who want to make a difference. The, this aspect of health and human services and health disparities was a relatively new focus for the organization. So um, it, it, it did really allow us to leverage um, the talents uh, and the enthusiasm of that group uh, to, to work together. Amazing. Well, Dr. Brewer, could you summarize briefly for us the findings uh, of this initial paper? Great, yeah, so we sought to evaluate their perceptions and attitudes towards medical research amongst the African American women of the Lynx Incorporated, which is an international service organization. And we thought that this group would bring a unique perspective than those that have been traditionally studied in lower socioeconomic groups. And we surveyed them on their willingness to participate and intention to participate in medical research and also obtain their attitudes in general towards research. And we had great results. So we found that they were really willing to participate in a variety of research studies, particularly those involving interviews and those with the provision of blood samples. And their attitudes towards research were overall positive. Um, they felt, the majority felt that participation in research was beneficial to society. Um, it would mean better care to them and others in the community at large, and that it would help to reduce health disparities. Now, historically, this has been a community of research participants where it's been a little challenging 
to see an enthusiastic uh, participation, right? I mean, historically, we have uh, the unfortunate Tuskegee uh, experiment that took advantage of a group of uh, African-American men, as I recall, and then there's been perceptions within this community or within, let's say, minority communities in general about what does this mean? Will I be treated fairly? Will I get the best care? Uh, were any of the findings surprising to you, Sharon, in terms of the historical nature of this, and do you still see uh, us as having a significant amount of distance to cover to improve research opportunities for non-majority groups? Well, I think what was um, heartening was that among this group, who are leaders and, um, and uh, thought leaders in their communities, there was a much greater acceptance of being a part of research. And so we looked at that as an opportunity that we might use that, the, the, the links in their communities to help move things. On the other hand, there still was a fairly high level of concern about, for instance, I think what surprised us a bit was um, the use of their medical record. Uh, I think a lot of us who work at Mayo, where a lot of our, our, our work and our reputation has to do with looking at past medical records and, and saying, you know, the 100 cases of whatever, that this was, and, and so we can only conjecture, but maybe it is a sense of mistrust and mm -hmm. privacy. And I think it, it is the mistrust um, because of uh, most healthcare organizations and researchers being people who are, um, in a big building that's far away, and uh, for people who are not of the don't, don't look and act like our participants, that we still have a lot of things that we need to do as a research organization um, to be in those communities because that's really the only way we'll build that trust. Indeed, indeed. I think 21% of the survey respondents said they thought it might be unsafe to participate in clinical research. Now, these respondents are the most upwardly mobile, empowered, economically empowered, and socially empowered members of any community, uh, majority or minority, and yet a fifth of them are concerned, uh, and yet they're very well-educated, highly intelligent, highly successful. What, does this, what insights did you glean from that in terms of that, that number struck me as a little high. I would have expected it to be lower, but I accept it for what it is. Well, and uh, we didn't have a reference group, so I'm not sure if we asked a general population that very question, because when you think of research, sometimes uh, people talk about being a guinea pig. And if you are, um, have an end-stage heart problem or cancer problem, you are often much more willing to participate and take that risk um, we were asking a predominantly healthy population. Um, and so for them, maybe in their mindset, thought, well, if I were to do, you know, I'm feeling well now if I did it. So I don't know what to make of it, but I think it's something what it tells us. We need to address that upfront in our consents, in our conversations with all research participants um, to weigh the risks and the benefits. And to maybe reassure them that uh, they lose no option for health care by just being in research. That's right. Dr. Brewer, what what lessons do you see here from, from individual researchers like you and Dr. Hayes and me talking with patients and trying to recruit more minority subjects? What lessons can we learn from a, from a researcher standpoint? And then Dr. Hayes, I'm gonna ask you if you could talk about it from more of a organizational and a big picture standpoint. So I agree that, you know, in order to increase the diversity of our research pool, we must go out into our communities and educate them on the benefits of research participation and also let them know how we plan on using data from clinical trials to their direct benefit and towards the eradication of health disparities. And I think it's also very important that we move from a kind of us versus them to a we paradigm towards redefining our research priorities. And I think this can definitely assist us in developing more of a partnership amongst medical institutions in our communities. Thank you. Well, I think I'll build on that because I think our community-based participatory research initiatives that we're doing here at Mayo and across the U.S. other organizations where it is, you know, we're, we're going into the communities talking, meeting in their, whether it's their place of worship or at the Lynx um, a national convention, that says we're partners and that is the best way. I mean, just like being invited to a friend's home, um, there's a different comfort level mm -hmm. than going to seeing them at work. So I think we need to up our game on that. And, in, and from an institutional standpoint, we need to train our colleagues to be comfortable and embrace it because it's a very different paradigm than what we've uh, what we've been um, traditionally taught about research, 
Uh, and so, and I think, you know, wearing my diversity and inclusion hat, I think increasing the diversity of our staff and our researchers is critical. And if we don't have individuals who are researchers of that community for which we're trying to reach out, then using novel methods by um, hiring uh, community liaisons who can mm -hmm. help us as researchers um, understand the cultural needs and the research needs and the communication needs of those communities. Now those are all things that we're doing at Mayo mm -hmm. more frequently and I do think that um, that's going to reap a lot of benefits for us. As I understand it, the two of you are involved in a couple of innovative research projects at the moment. One looking at houses of worship and one doing remote-based cardiac rehab care to address these issues. Would either of you care to comment on that and just describe for the people watching today what you're doing uh, to give them some ideas on what innovations they might bring to their practices? So as a part of my passion, um, I really would like to increase awareness of health disparities, not only amongst the population that I plan to study, but also amongst my colleagues in medicine. And through my research, through community-based participatory research in local African-American churches, I plan to increase knowledge and awareness of heart disease so that I can then in turn help to eradicate this in a population that needs, to, um, needs the most help as possible. Um, and currently we're working with local African-American churches here in Rochester, Minnesota um, with a um, prevention program in which we bring in experts from Mayo Clinic to teach our um, participants on heart disease risk factors. How is it being received? Uh, it, it's, it's going very well actually. Um, they're really excited to see our faces. They're really eager to learn and they're excited about the long-term partnerships that can come out of our research. This is marvelous. So researchers should not be afraid of being creative and going into the community, should they? Not at all. Sharon, do you think we can improve healthcare delivery doing the same models? I think this is the only way that we will improve healthcare delivery because if we aren't including all of our populations that are under our care and don't understand their cultural um, and educational needs um, and their health needs, then we won't. I think another thing that came out of this project and this partnership with the uh, Links Incorporated is it's ongoing. So uh, the senior author on this paper, Dr. Carmen Radecki Breitkoff, um, is a co-PI with a Links uh, scientist at University of Michigan and we've received NIH funding to take um, this initiative, work with the Links chapters to develop educational programs both for Links members, these influential women, but for them to then take into their communities to increase awareness about um, the need for full participation by all communities um, because through that full participation will be better health. And if we have people watching today from large academic research organizations or sponsors, drug companies or others, and they're interested in partnering with you and Mayo and the links, would it be okay if they contacted you? I would welcome that. <laughs> I, I think it's a splendid <laughs> idea. As I've shared with both of uh, the doctors with me today, uh, I spent the last seven years working on some large clinical trials and we identified that especially minority women were among the highest who discontinued study drugs. And we feel strongly uh, as trialists that unless the trials can be generalized to all populations, the data is less than perfect. And yet we struggle with trying to figure out how best to retain these subjects. What advice do you have for trialists watching today about how they can better keep uh, subjects who are less affluent or who are in minority populations in trials? Well, I think um, being creative and understanding um, so it is through research like this that will better inform and help our research colleagues. Um, but if you are recruiting for a trial and you are not um, getting enough of any type of subject so that you're going to have meaningful data, um, I think that then really targeting. And I, I think bringing in somebody who is interested in those communities. We have folks here in Rochester that are specifically working with Somali communities on um, GI diseases that specifically uh, affect Africans. And you can't just walk in and say, I'm going to, uh, I'd like to study a liver disease on, on, on you today. So having those community connections. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's probably the, the best. And perhaps exit interviews on um, individuals that do decide to drop out of a trial and understand what it was. Is it childcare? Is it parking? Is it mm -hmm. something that, is it of course. being a caregiver for someone <coughs> at home and being yes. unable, especially yes. for women? And also recognizing the perceptions and attitudes about distrust, 
uh, and historical issues and being mm -hmm. sensitive to that. Well, congratulations again to both of you and all of your colleagues on the paper. It's a, a tremendous uh, initial publication. I look forward to more research. And Dr. Brewer, uh, I hope that you'll continue this passion in your entire career in uh, doing this because uh, you're off to a great start, and I want to thank you for your commitment to doing thank this. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, our two guests today, Dr. Uh, LaPrincess Brewer and Dr. Sharon Hayes, and congratulate their entire research team uh, for uh, the efforts today, and want to thank you for joining us. And I want to challenge each of you who uh, are watching to consider what you can do to engage more underrepresented populations to participate in clinical research so that the data we discover can be taken to all populations and help all people. Thanks again. This is Dr. Scott Wright from the Mayo Clinic Division of Cardiology. We're glad you joined us today.